know Christ, a television ministry of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. Here is your host, Rev. Jeff Peterson. Recently, I took a trip to Norway and also Russia. And in Norway, where I was going, it was Tromsø, Norway, which is a city above the Arctic Circle. It's way on the northern part, uh, tip of Norway. And why was I there? Well, I was there to run a half marathon, and then also to go dog sled uh, riding, and then also go to a place where, they, where you can feed reindeer, and then go for a reindeer sled ride. And I'll tell you what, I did all these things, and, and it was just fantastic. What a wonderful experience that was. I was so glad that I had the opportunity to do so. But in flying into uh, Tromsø, I just remember flying and, and the pilot saying, well, there's a big snowstorm going on, which I think there's always a big snowstorm going on there. Don't ask me how they ever got an airport put in there, but they did. But the pilot just said, there's a big snowstorm going on and they're working very hard to clear the runway. And so we'll just continue to circle around until Eventually, it's clear enough for us to be able to land. <clears throat> and so we circled, I don't know, something like 45 minutes to an hour, just going around, you know, waiting for the okay to be able to land the plane, because here again, the snowstorm, and, and waiting for them to clear off, <laughs> being able to just get it cleared off enough to be able to land. Well, that time came, and I just remember the the plane as we were descending down and going to land. I mean, the plane was just going boom, 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 like this. And then finally it just somehow it landed and we were on the ground. You know, normally now it seems like whenever you fly, those planes, they take off and they land and you can't even hardly even tell that you landed. I mean, they do such a smooth job. But this was just like, don't ask me how that pilot landed this plane, but somehow he got it down and, and landed it. And as I looked out, well, if you want a job, you can go to Tromsø, Norway, and I'm sure that there's plenty of employment just as far as removing snow and chipping ice because there's lots of snow and lots of ice that has to be removed constantly there. But as I think about the pilot of the plane, to me, what a hero. To be able to land that plane, to me, it seems like this is just all the recipe for a disaster. But the pilot landed the plane. In the midst of a big storm, he was able to land that plane on that runway. And so whether it be the pilot of a plane, a pilot of a ship, a pilot of, um, or, or just you know, a driver of some kind driving us through some very difficult, stormy times, you know, those are always heroic people, people who you know, can definitely get through very tough times and to bring us to a place of peace. And so that's not you know, just people who are in charge of vehicles, so to speak, but it's also in life. When times get to be so tumultuous, so anxious, we always look for a leader who's calm, who can lead us through those times, to have that wisdom and that knowledge to say, well, this is how we're going to do this. And even at that, you know, sometimes the odds and chances aren't always very good. You know, here I am, a United States citizen, and it's just my perception. Maybe your perception is different, but who do we kind of venerate as our heroes today? But it would be sports heroes. It just seems like they become these iconic people that, you know, we're now paying upwards, you know, between 30 to $40 million a year because they are our heroes. We really admire how they can play their sport, whether they can throw touchdown passes or shoot the basketball through the hoop from a long distance. I mean, that seems to be what really excites people today would be our sports heroes. And, and so we kind of like to wear that, you know, those shirts or that gear that, you know, that whatever that sports hero was uh, promoting or selling. But the Scandinavian countries, who do they venerate? It's not sports people, but rather it would be like sea captains. They admire the sea captain 
that can bring the ship through the stormy soar, through the stormy seas to shore. And so I don't know who it is for you. Who do you admire to say, wow, that person's my hero? You know, you just are always kind of in awe of that person or people like it. And so we look at people who can go into high adventurous situations and and somehow to be able to get through these times and, and to bring us to a safe place, a secure place, a place of peace and rest. And so I'm going to read from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were other, also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. <clears throat> Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. The place of this story is the Sea of Galilee. And when we think about a sea, we think about a large body of water, almost the size of an ocean. But the Sea of Galilee, what's different about this sea is, number one, it's fresh water. It's not salt water, it's fresh water. And number two, it's really not the size of a sea. It's actually like a large lake. In fact, I know lakes in Minnesota and in Wisconsin that are larger than the Sea of Galilee. And when you're on the Sea of Galilee, you can actually see from one side to the other. I've been there before, and I'd have to say that one of the most inspiring times of my trip as I went to the Holy Land was going on a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee, and I was trying to envision all of this where, you know, Peter is catching his big catch of fish, or where, you know, Jesus is beckoning him to walk on the water. You know, there's you know, so many stories that kind of took place out on the sea here, but a lot of it has to do with, well, the miraculous catches of fish, Jesus calling the disciples, or in times where people are in great peril. Now, Jesus' disciples were called by Jesus. And so many of them were fishermen. They were experienced sailors. They had fished and they had sailed the Sea of Galilee for their whole lives. And so you would think that there is nothing that would... You know, that would catch them out off guard at this time. You know how it is in life so oftentimes where, you know, we've been doing a job or we've been living life in a certain place for so long that we kind of have the whole thing mastered. And we like that. We, we have confidence to say, I can go to my job. Not only do I understand how I do my job, but I'm also here that I can be of help to other people. You know, they got questions. How do I do this? How do I get through that? And so we like it when we have a command of our lives. We've been there. We've done that. We are experienced. And when things come up, we know how to handle them because we've been there and we have done it before. And so you'd think that would be the way that it was for Jesus' disciples. They know the sea. They know it like the back of their hand. There isn't anything that they haven't seen that they would probably ever have to deal with in their lives. And so that's what I find, one of the things that I find to be kind of peculiar about this story is that these experienced sailors, these experienced fishermen, all of a sudden this big storm came up and they were caught off guard. And you know, as I've done some research and study on the Sea of Galilee, 
you know, for a sea, another thing about the sea is that it's not very deep. And here again, I can't tell you just how deep it is, but when water, when a body of water is shallow, then it can, it can become tumultuous, a lot, a lot choppier than a deeper body of water. But then also you got Mount Hermon at the north end of the Sea of Galilee, and apparently the contour of all of that as the strong winds can come off of there, it can create an abrupt storm. But the way that I look at this story is that, you know, here again we can scientific, scientifically analyze all this, saying, well, you know, if this happens and if that happens, and based on this, that, and the other thing, you know, you can kind of have that term, the, the perfect storm. But to me, what has happened here is that God has created a storm that nobody has ever seen before. Nobody's ever seen a storm like this before, and nobody has seen a storm like this since. And the reason why I say that is just the reaction of the disciples. I'm sure they've been on, these, on the sea on this, when it was stormy before, and they knew just exactly how to handle it, but this was way beyond their element. And so they were frightened. They felt like they were going to perish. And so what hope do they have? Well, the hope that they have is the same hope that we have, is that Jesus is in the boat. And what is interesting about Jesus, now here again, you know, we look at the reaction. You know, a lot of times we can you kind of look at things from a circumstantial point of view and just the reaction of the disciples would say, oh, they're in a storm that, they never, that they've never been in before. But then when we look at Jesus, we find that to be just as uh, peculiar. He's not phased by this storm even a little bit to the point where he's got the opposite reaction of the disciples as they are panicking for their lives, Jesus is fast to sleep in the boat. He's sleeping. His head is on a cushion. And so what does this have to say about Jesus? Well, Jesus is God in human flesh. So God, who is the creator of the earth, God, who is, in a sense, the Lord of the sea, isn't phased by this storm. Now, in some ways, I read this and I think, well, doesn't Jesus care? You know, when we think about life, yeah, literally we can be on, we can be on the storms in life. We can literally be in a storm. Now, I don't know about you, but I think you're probably a lot like me in that you're going to do everything you can to prevent being in a storm. Now, a storm can be the literal storm, but it can also be the figurative storm. But either way, it's no fun. I'm in a storm right now, and I feel like my life is in jeopardy, or at least, you know, a lot of my life right now seems to be, you know, a lot of, it's being threatened right now, and I don't like this. It's frightening. And the way that we react during those times. You know, to see people and how they live their lives and how they react under normal circumstances. Well, all of a sudden, if there's a tornado that's going through a park where there's really no place of shelter, to see people react, well, I'll tell you what, they are two different people. And understandably so, because they feel like their life is in jeopardy right now. Is how many times in life do we find ourselves in a situation and we don't know where to turn, so we turn to God and we're praying and we wonder, God, do you care? Are you there even? And that's kind of how the disciples are feeling. Here we are, we're on the verge of dying. And we look at Jesus and he's sleeping like he could care less about all of this. Well, here again, what makes our lives in peril doesn't make God 
threatened. Because here again, God is God. God doesn't die. God is always, he's got command over everything. And so just when they felt like the boat was going to break up and they were all going to perish, Jesus just simply says to the storm, be still, be calm, and the, calms, and the storm cal- calms down and the sea is now at a state of peace. And that's what we have to always remember, is that the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard and keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's from Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse 7. That even when the whole world around us is storming, that Christ is arisen, that Christ dwells within us, and that even if we die physically, that spiritually we are alive. We always are alive in the Lord, and that is that Christ in our vessel, Christ in our lives, gives us peace. And it's something that we don't understand. It's just Christ in our lives. It's hard to explain to our neighbor. He says, the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding. And this isn't something that you can buy in the store. This is something that you cannot earn or obtain. You know, it's not something that you can somehow intellectualize yourself into. It's only in receiving Jesus and you have this peace. And, and for those of you who have prayed to the Lord, that you know what I'm talking about, that yes, I've had peace in the midst of the storm. And we hang on to Jesus knowing that, that storms do not last forever. And just when we think that our lives, our marriages, our relationship, our workplace, our church, whatever it is, is going to break up, well, God brings us through these times, and he makes us stronger as a result of going through these times. You know, I think about John Wesley. He's just was a great pastor, theologian, living in the 18th century. And he was like the Billy Graham of England. He, or the, he would go around and he'd be preaching, and tens of thousands of people were coming to the Lord. I mean, here again, he'd be like in stadiums that would be packed and be preaching, and people would be coming to faith. Well, as settlers were coming to America, he wanted to come and get the church settled here, started up as well. And so he, oh, and by the way, John Wesley would be, in a sense, the founder of the Methodist church. But as he was coming over to this country to get the church established, One of the things that happened, well, he had to go by boat because back then they didn't have planes. But across in the Atlantic, and it seems like almost every time you'd hear of stories of people crossing the Atlantic to come to America, you'd hear about them somewhere along the line being in a terrible storm. And so for John Wesley, that was his case. He was in this terrible storm. You know, the ship, they really felt, everybody felt this was it. This ship is going to break apart in the storm and they all were going to perish. Everybody was panicking, including John Wesley. I mean, he was just, I mean, his, his hands and his knuckles were white as he was trying to grip whatever he could on the ship. But one thing he noticed is that down in the cargo bay, down below, there was a group of Moravian Christians. And as a storm that was going to bust their ship apart to where they all were perishing, these Moravian Christians, what were they doing? They were down there praying and they were singing hymns and they were at perfect peace. Matter of fact, (laughs) they just felt like, well, in a moment here, we're going to be meeting our maker, Jesus. To live as Christ and to die is gain. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who dwells within me. That they have this strong faith and they firmly believed. 
But for John Wesley, this great preacher and, and theologian, he, he couldn't believe this. How can they be at such perfect peace? Well, John Wesley came to the America and he worked to, with the natives and, and with the early settlers to get the church going here in the United States. And then he went back to, to London, went back to England, but it just still troubled him in his faith, saying, you know, he brings tens of thousands of people to faith, but he questioned his own faith. Why, do, why don't I have the same faith, the same peace that these Moravian Christians have? One day he was in London and he, and there was a, a pastor who was reading Martin Luther's preface or his commentary on, on Romans. And I don't know exactly where he was reading from it. But as John Wesley was listening to this, it's like he felt the Holy Spirit come upon him and touch his heart. He could feel the burning of the Holy Spirit within him, and that was the moment for him. That's when he felt this perfect peace of God. Life transforming where, yes, as he brought so many people to faith to say, I now know deep in my heart that I've got this strong faith this peace of God. And so as we think about being in the ship, as we think about being in the boat, to know that when Christ is in, the ve in our vessel, that we can sail with the storms. And so I think about around the year 1628, the Swedes, the Swedish people, they had a dynasty called the Vasa dynasty where you had, uh, I believe, three kings and they really rose to power during that time. But maybe their most powerful and influential king was Gustavus Adolphus. He was a, a warring king. Matter of fact, he's considered to be the father of modern war. And he was fighting out in some of the Baltic countries. He was fighting in Poland. And he was having this destroyer ship built. It was something new, something modern. But when I say a destroyer ship for this day and age, it's where they had two levels of cannons. And so this was going to be a menace out in the Baltic Sea and it was going to really advance Gustavus Adolphus's fighting military purposes. But as he was fighting in Poland, that ship wasn't out in the sea, and he was wondering, well, where is it? It should have been built by now. It should be out in the sea. And so he kept writing letters. Get that ship out here. And so the workers, they were working as hard as they could, as fast as they could, to try to get that that ship battle ready. And so in their haste, they must have cut some corners, but the day came when that ship was to embark and it went out into the Stockholm Harbor a little ways and being it was, it was top heavy, that it capsized and it sunk to the bottom of, of the harbor. Well, 333 years later, they raised this ship and now it's, now it's a museum in Stockholm. And, and so now it, it's quite a, a money maker, quite a tourist attraction, a revenue maker for Stockholm. But the way that I look at it is that if you're going to build a big destroyer ship, the best thing that can happen to it is that it can sink down to the bottom of the harbor. If that's your intent is to build a ship to harm people, then it's best that it just sinks. But we must remember that God has blessed us with a ship that doesn't sink. 
There's no cannons on this ship. And this ship is called the church. And this ship sails the seas of life. It gets us through the big storms of life and brings us to the shores of salvation. In the Scandinavian countries, if you go into their churches, you'll see that they have model ships suspended from their ceilings to remind them that they are seafaring people, but also reminds them of their baptism and, and what the church means to them and that it is the church that brings them through the tumultuous waters of sin, death, and a devil to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. I once was visiting with a pastor uh, of the Vartov Church in downtown Copenhagen, Denmark. And I was asking him a little bit about the ship, and so he was telling me about the ship, and he said one day he had some school kids in there, and, and so the <clears throat> kids were asking, well, if this ship doesn't sink, then why are there lifeboats on the ship? And he said, well, those lifeboats are for us, who are members of this ship, or who are members of the church, to go out and to bring salvation to those who are out into the sea perishing. That as we share the good news of salvation, they are brought onto the ship. And so that's the thing that we must always remember, is that this ship doesn't sink. It is a ship of salvation, just like Noah and the ark, that, you know, as... God saved Noah and his family on the ark. That would be a total of well, Noah and his family, eight people all together, that we now are brought into the ark, and that is the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so when you're going through difficult times, pray to God and ask yourself, really, what is the issue here? What is the rudimentary problem here? And when you have identified that, then pray to God saying, what are my options? And and God will give you some options, and as you pray about it, what is the best option that I have to exercise? And as you've chosen that option, then you also pray, asking God, what are the resources that you've given to me to exercise this option to get me through this time? And to know that God does get us strong. But we have to remember that the church is that we are the church together, that we are not alone in this world, that we're not alone in this storm, but Jesus is there, and he also has given to us the other community of believers that gives us strength during those stormy times in life. You have been watching To Know Christ with Reverend Jeff Peterson, pastor of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. For a donation of $15 or more, you can receive a copy of Pastor Peterson's latest book, Prayer, A Practical Guide to Getting God's Direction. Thank you for watching, and tune in again next week for To Know Christ.